Good afternoon, everyone. You find yourself in the right place. We'll just allow a minute or two to pass to let folks um, sign in after clinic, et cetera, and then we'll get started. Thanks. All right, I think we'll get started. I'm Dr. Linda Montgomery. I'm the Program Director at Family Medicine. Um, and I want to welcome you to our presentation today for Academy of Medical Educators Grand Rounds. I want to um, in, uh, introduce Dr. Wong and Dr. Kane. Dr. Wong uh, received her MD and MPH from Boston University. She completed her residency this past year in family medicine in our urban underserved track here at CU and served as our chief resident in our as our uh, chief resident of quality and safety. She's now a faculty fellow in the departments of family medicine at CU and Denver Health, and she's studying health equity in primary care for people with disabilities. Dr. Wong's been involved in disability advocacy for over 10 years and previously served on the board of directors of the Disability Policy Consortium of Massachusetts. Dr. Kane is a clinical professor at the CU Department of Family Medicine with 35 years of experience practicing and teaching students and residents in Colorado. A special note, Dr. Kane was a founder of the internationally impactful Tar Wars program, is a past president of the American Academy of Family Physicians, and is currently the chair of the board of directors of the Amputee Coalition. And away from medicine, Dr. Kane is also known for his prodigious sense of humor and his pursuit of such whimsical interests as kite design and small plane aviation. He also holds the first gold medal in adaptive snowboarding from the United States Snowboarding Association. So we're very happy to have you here, Drs. Kane and Dr. Wong. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Linda. So how does someone get interested in disability and medical education? My interest came about entirely by accident. It turns out that 25 years ago, after a bad crash, I woke up in the intensive care unit and spent two weeks on a ventilator, had my face reconstructed, my chest, my arms were damaged, one leg was removed at the accident, and I chose to have one leg amputated six years later. In my medical career, part of the time I walk and part of the time I use a wheelchair. And it seems like for other people, perceptions can vary. I call this lessons from the other end of the stethoscope. My hope is to be able to share with you some of those learnings along with Alicia. Introduce yourself. Great. And I also came out of uh, to this with from personal experience. Uh, I was born with a disability called arthrogryposis and um, it's been a prominent part of my life growing up and uh, led, me, led me to the work I do now. We talk about diversity a lot right now in medical education. We talk about diversity because we know that people that have different ethnicities, different orientations have higher levels of poverty. They may be less likely to be employed. They may be less likely to graduate from high school or higher education. And they may have higher rates of drug and alcohol abuse. What we might not think about is that people with disabilities are also a diversity issue because people with disabilities have a higher incidence of poverty, a lower incidence of being employed, a lower rate of graduation from high school, and are more likely to use tobacco and um, other drugs. And yet people with disabilities are one of the largest groups of diversity in the United States. About 22% of the people, according to the census, have mobility of, of a disability, with 13% having mobility issues, 10.5% having cognitive issues, and then a mixture of difficulties with vision, with self-care, with independent living. One of the things that's interesting is when we step back with that, we'll see that, remember, 13% of people have a physical disability. 
people graduate from high school with disabilities at a high rate, almost 11%. Almost 11% of people in undergraduate college graduate for a disability. But when you look at who gets into medical school and who matriculates, less than a percent, 0.56% of people in medical school have a disability. That seemed crazy to me. I mean, that can't be true for us, can it? So I thought I might do a, if not terribly scientific study, I've taught for about 18 years at the University of Colorado's Department of Family Medicine in our residency program. And we have a wall of heroes on our wall that lists everyone that's graduated and their photo from every class. So my non-scientific study was to stand in front of that wall and to count and say, how many of these people are Caucasian? How many of these people are women? How many of these people are LGBTQ? And how many of these people have a disability? The results were fascinating. You know, about 51% uh, of our population is women and 60% of our residency or one class are, have been women. When you look at people of color, we're at 22%, which is not quite up to the 26 to 28%, but closing in on that range of people that identify as non-Caucasian in our census. When we talk about people that are open LGBTQ, and that, by the way, that was people that have been open to me and have revealed to me, that was about 4% of our class. And although we know that that number is higher in our population, in Gallup polls, people self-reveal at around the 4% uh, rate. But what about people with disabilities? How many people have disabilities in that class of 179 people over 18 years? One, and she's with us today. And that makes us exactly the same as the United States on average of 0.56%. So our hope today is to talk with you a little bit about disability as a diversity issue inside medical education. We'll talk about the social model of disability. We'll talk about how people are, are uh, people with disabilities are underrepresented in medicine and the literature behind that. We'll talk a little bit about the disparities and why it's hard for trainees that have a disability in medical education. And we'll have some three very practical tips for us to do as medical educators at the University of Colorado to change that, to help bring more people in with disabilities and help people with disabilities thrive inside their medical education environment. Alicia. Great. So we're just going to do a quick run through of disability history. And this is a picture of Aristotle. So in terms of framing disability, it's always been a part of the human condition um, and the stigma around disability formed even starting in Aristotle's time. Um, he wrote, quote, as to the exposure and rearing of children, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. Um, and that really represents the idealism surrounding beauty and perfection as valuable. Next slide. Um, centuries later, uh, we get to the view that disability is a burden on society. People were literally shipped off um, to the outskirts of areas or left in certain areas um, so that they would no longer be considered a burden um, and interact with them. The, the moral model of disability also emerged around this time um, and really was viewed either as like a sin on the part of the individual or on part of their families of that individual. Next slide. Around the turn of the century, um, the idea of being feeble-minded uh, in the eugenics movement started emerging. Uh, this is a picture of Henry Goddard. Um, he wrote of late, we have recognized a higher type of defective, the moron, and have discovered that he is a burden, that he is responsible to a large degree for many, if not all of our social problems. Um, and this is really based on uh, largely an intelligence tests. Um, they were, the intelligence tests, for example, were used to, um, were given to immigrants uh, Ellis Island, um, and uh, really, instead of challenging the validity of the test, start to reinforce um, negative um, perceptions of disability uh, and people um, from uh, su such as immigrants to the United States. Um, the eugenics movement really kind of paved the way for course sterilization of people with disabilities, um, and in World War II during the Holocaust. Um, uh, okay, next slide. Institutionalization really represents the level of segregation of people with disabilities um, and the extreme neglect that they experienced in those institutions. Um, there was ultimately a very large push to uh, move out of 
um, institutionalization and towards an independent living movement. Next slide. And disability stigma is quite prevalent in our society, even now, um, especially in popular culture, very much uh, it creates a view of dis disability as something to be infantilized, a paternalistic view, such as through the MDA telethon with Jerry Lewis, um, or people who um, freak shows, for example, with P.T. Barnum, um, and then movies like The Hunchback of Notre Dame, it's really thinking of them as um, abnormal. Um, and then there's also inspirational um, uh, stigmas as well, such as the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Next slide. The disability civil rights movement uh, kind of grew out of the momentum of the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s uh, and really centered primarily around at the time the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and getting that actually enforced by the government. Um, and ultimately led to the creation of the ADA, which provided civil rights for people with disabilities. Next slide. And these are the major policies um, that are, kind of, are applicable to our discussion today. So the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 504 specifically, so states that um, anybody with federal funding needs to avoid discrimination uh, against people with disabilities. And then the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA um, grew out of the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. And that really um, forces the idea of um, providing children with equivalent educations uh, in the least restrictive way possible. And then the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 was passed to protect civil rights. And the ADA Amendment Act uh, was passed in 2008 and kind of helps redefine the definitions around disability um, in relation to the ADA. Next slide. So the main thing that we wanna discuss for the, our first point is that we created the medical model um, and it frames disability it, as abnormal and something that needs to be fixed by people in our profession. Um, it's viewed inherently as a negative characteristic um, and the goal essentially through the medical model is to make people as normal as possible. Um, it challenged, it views the problems as the fault of the person with the disability and not necessarily by society. And it also creates an us and them mentality, which is uh, not what we want, both when we are trying to uh, train people with disabilities in um, our programs and then also caring for patients. It also reinforces the idea that people with disabilities have a poorer quality of life. Next slide. And so what we need to do is we really need to shift and adopt the social model of disability and really that views disability as a, a characteristic that we would age, race, gender, something that's not inherently negative, but more just a part of who we are um, and that the challenges rise from barriers that society creates and then the goal is to be inclusive. Next slide. So today we, we're going to start with a social model of disability that Dr. Wong has just talked about. Next, we'll talk about disability and how people with disabilities have been underrepresented in medicine before we move on with the parts about how we can look at disparities for people in, in uh, training inside medicine and some solutions. One of the things that we don't, even when we're well-intentioned around diversity, there's a lot of intention right now around diversity. And when we look back at our diversity statements, this is my own department, very well-intentioned, very well thought out. They talk about how we are really looking to create a, a diverse environment that includes people that are underrepresented in medicine with regard to race, ethnicity, social economic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religion. And even with a very intentional group, we accidentally left that out. We've corrected that as you'll see. But one of the things that we'll talk about is how we make certain that people that are looking from our programs outside can recognize that, they wel that we welcome people with diversity. There's been um, in the last decade, a lot of literature that talks about how people with disabilities have not been included inside medical education. The American Medical Association Journal of Ethics has talked about the prevalence of the low prevalence of people that are inside our learning environments and has studied how college students that have disabilities seek admissions or having challenges of getting admitted to medical school because of some challenges. Some of those challenges have to do with the technical standards. This is an article from 2012 from the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, that actually looked at the, the technical standards 
um, and said and noticed that technical standards were quite scattered and not very organized across the United States, that there's a lack of consensus about what is a valid technical standard. So this article in 2012 um, uh, uh, prodded the University of Michigan to be able to survey technical standards for medical schools across the United States. And when you looked at all of their, their research across medical schools, half of the technical standards were but half of the, the medical schools were very vague about can, candidates with disabilities were evaluated. Only one third of the technical standards actually said that they would accommodate someone that has a disability. And it was, it was very, very hard on more than half of the medical school websites to find out any information about disability or about those technical standards, which then prompted the next AAMC article in 2016 that has said that, that the truth is that most medical schools uh, do technical standards do not provide reasonable accommodation and are actually in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And they're wanting to push us to have further study to understand how schools can operationalize technical standards that are different that would allow us to reach the, the goals of the ADA. One of the big things that, that uh, these articles focus on is a shift from what, what we would say, not what you have to have, but how you have to be able to be a medical student or a physician. Traditional technical standards have oftentimes said things like you need two eyes, two ears, two hands, two legs, um, and those kinds of standards. When in truth, um, most people in medicine can be able with accommodation, they're missing some parts or access can still be able to access their skills. Instead of saying you have to be able to do chest compressions for a core, maybe you could say you have to be able to understand and run a team uh, to be able to run a core zero. So instead of specific physical cognitive behavioral uh, standards, focusing on the outcomes and clarifying what abilities are needed to be demonstrated with or without accommodation. If you're interested in learning about what it's like to be able to face those challenges, the AAMC along with UCSF has created a very informative uh, large study that surveyed people that have learning, uh, learning disorders, physical disorders, disabilities um, inside medical education and to see what their lived experience is like and to be able to see what kinds of ways that medical schools could work with that. Um, if you're looking for a brief uh, primer on this, the introductory chapter here written by Dale Kirsch at the time the CEO talks about the importance to medical schools to be able to face this challenge. Uh, we talked a little bit now about the social model, about how people with disabilities are underrepresented in medicine. I'd like to have us now learn uh, from somebody that has been a medical student with a disability insight and to share, Alicia said she would be able to share her experiences. Great. So before we start off, I just want to say that these are my own experiences um, and I'm not trying to say that this is true for everybody, but I think it is a good jumping off point for a discussion. Um, so first I want to talk about ableism and microaggressions within medical education. Um, so throughout my training, there were um, various reactions to my uh, disability. I would say um, the following quotes are good examples of ableist and microaggressive um, attitudes that I did encounter at times. So for example, um, per, uh, one of my professors said, if I were a patient, I wouldn't want you to be my doctor. Um, did you think about your disability before you applied to medical school? And uh, this is from a, uh, a surgery rotation comment. Alicia demonstrated an impressive level of maturity, pragmatism, and willingness to attempt tasks that she was less likely to perform successfully. And have you thought about what you would do if this doesn't work out? So I think collectively all of these um, comments really create, have a, an underlying assumption of incompetence you know, because of your disability, I wouldn't want you to be my doctor because of your disability, you be, I would expect you to be less likely to perform this specific task because of your disability. I don't know if this will work out for you. We thought about something else. Um, obviously these, this is a harmful thing, um, creates an unsafe environment for the trainee. Uh, the next point I wanna make is uh, talking about support and uh, that we, there really needs to be somebody within your program or your institution or even an office um, designated to take ownership and leadership over advocating uh, for people with disabilities. And primarily when I reached out, there were different um, levels of support. Uh, you can put all the quotes in, Jeff. I think there are three. Um, and then, uh, so for example, that's a great question. I don't know how to help you though. 
um, was a very common answer. Um, have you talked to so-and-so? They can probably help you. Um, and then oftentimes uh, I would reach out and sometimes there'd be silence or maybe somebody would get back to me, you know, weeks after the fact um, when it wasn't as helpful. And so there were delays and a lot of um, extra effort on my part to try to figure out who I needed to go to to set up the accommodations that I needed. Um, and it would be ideal to have somebody be a point person um, for trainees as they go through the process. Next slide. Uh, in terms of applying to programs, both medical schools and residencies, um, it's a pretty complicated process. Um, and I chose personally to disclose in my personal statement. Um, I thought that would be a good screening, essentially. Um, and my goal when applying was to avoid any type of situation where I would end up at a program that was not safe or um, accommodating. Um, I did actually apply to three different specialties in order to find that, uh, that fit and um, did end up in a program that obviously I'm very happy at um, in the specialty that I want to. Um, but I think the amount of work that went into uh, finding programs that I thought would be um, accommodating was very extensive and more so than anyone else. And so really the priority for me was first, um, how safe is the environment and then what programs do I actually wanna to go to? Um, also in the process, uh, I did have a program say, I'm very sorry to inform you that our committee determined that we would be unable to provide the accommodations you would need in our program. Um, and that email came to me a week before rank night. And so um, I think uh, I ended up spending a lot of time interviewing um, at that program, for example, financial effort was made, um, cost, and then there really needs to be more structure and thoughtful process around how to um, interview people with disabilities uh, who are trainees and then have thoughtful discussions and also uh, make sure that disability is not the center of the interview either. Um, I think in my, um, my interviews with most of the program directors, I pretty much had a standardized question that I would ask just to see how flexible or accommodating the program might be. Um, but sometimes we ended up talking mostly about that and not necessarily about the assets that I could bring to the program as a resident. Next slide. So why the disparity? Um, essentially, there's a lack of knowledge and experience by faculty for the most part, I think in part because there are so few uh, trainees with disabilities who enter in medical school and do training that way. Um, there's also uh, not a great uh, coordinating system of disability services. So at my medical school, for example, the medical school is separate from the disability accommodations office, which was through the larger university. And then I needed an accommodation at the hospital. For example, I needed a reach bar installed in the locker room of the hospital for my surgery rotation so I could change um, that uh, at, into and out of scrubs easily. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about who was going to pay for the bar, who was allowed to install the bar, where the bar was going to be. Um, and it took uh, several months and ultimately it did get installed, but it was about two months after the, after I had had my surgery rotation. Um, so there needs to be better coordination between all of those offices, um, especially at a program that has you going to multiple different places. And then there's a summary of accommodations in a competitive environment. Uh, that's true for any level, even going back to middle school, high school and higher education, um, but especially with medicine, I think that that's more important. And so it's just making sure that you are looking at not necessarily what is um, fair to everybody else, but really what does the, the trainee need to be accommodated. And then, and then the other uh, two, second last is medical training is quite rigid. It's uh, physically demanding, we all know that. Um, but accommodations require an inherent sense of flexibility. Um, and then um, there was a good quote about um, from a book that I just read from um, by Rebecca Tausig that says, there's something unsettling about offering accommodations for an exceptional body when the entire system surrounding that body is built on the assumption that more and faster and harder and higher is fundamentally, fundamentally inherently superior. Um, and when you value um, employees for arbitrary measurements of work, like arriving early, leaving late, never taking sick days or time off or showing up on the weekend, you do not demonstrate an appreciation for those who have a need, who say no, enforce boundaries and require flexibility. Um, so really the rigidity of medical training needs to be changed to address you know, 
trainee wellness overall, which we know is an issue, uh, but also especially for people with disabilities. And then the last part is the power differential. Um, so this, is, especially as a trainee, it's very difficult to advocate for yourself um, if you're being evaluated by the person that you are trying to advocate to. So you really, again, go, linking back to identifying somebody to advocate on your behalf is very important. One of the things that we talk about a lot in diversity is about what you might call the minority tax. Those of us around the table understand that if someone is of a different ethnicity than everyone else around the table, oftentimes that there's a tax that comes along with that. They have to be able to understand the culture, explain the culture, and oftentimes are volunteered or voluntold to be able to address differences with minority issues inside medical education. There's also what you might call the the minority tax for people with disabilities. Alicia has talked on about some of those things. One of the things is, is that there's a need for pre-planning. If you're a person that uses a wheelchair for your mobility, every single rotation you go to every two weeks or four weeks, you have to know, can I get in the door? Am I able to get in the room? Can I wash my hands, get to the otoscope? Can I get into the preceptor room? You have to be able to pre-plan every single part of that step. That's a place where um, an accommodating university residency program can be of help. Another uh, area of tax is it, it's sometimes harder for people with a disability to actually move distances. If you were to look at the closest handicapped uh, spot for parking to the AO1 building, it's about five or 600 steps. The closest non-disabled parking spot is 800 steps away. So the ability to have a, a challenge when you have a high level of need for mobility in an environment that may not be set up to have accommodation work effectively is challenging. Uh, Alicia has talked about asking for accommodation is taxing. It is emotionally, it is time consuming, and it is a challenge for someone that's in a work environment with superiors to be able to say, I need some help with doing this in a legal way. And having that power differential makes it difficult for someone that's in a learner environment. Having the university or the residency program, having a place to the, an ombuds person or a contact person to be able to help with that process make certain that that's not a favor, but that's actually part of the law of what we do to help make certain that we have an open and accommodating space. And Alicia commented about this, it's not uncommon to have people hear or say, it's not fair that someone has a different call schedule or has a different amount of time for a test allotment. And those are things that people like, people that are in faculty roles and administrative roles need to be able to quell in the same way that we no longer ask people that are women when they interview about their plans for childbearing during their interview process. So um, uh, why do we do this? Why do we care? It turns out that it's the very same reasons that we talk about including a more diverse medical school environment for learners, for people that are of different ethnicity or sexual orientation. This are four, these are four lists about why we should do this about disability from the AAMC. Number one, when we have people that are trainees or people that are trained with people that have disabilities or people that have disabilities that care for patients, it increases the level of patient satisfaction and compliance across their patient population. This is exactly the same things we talk about when we talk about including different ethnicities. We also learned that Alicia talked earlier about that medical model, which is oftentimes an up-down superior. When you put someone that happens to have, uh, that is a sight challenge person next to a, that is a medical student, next to an able-bodied medical student, they learn that they are equals and that they face the world with some different abilities, but they face the world with the same values and the same goals. And it changes the way that people think about people with disabilities when you co-train with them. The AAMC strongly recommends that we include disability in our curriculum, talking about the right language, the way we relate to people, where you stand when you talk with someone that is using a chair. I have had someone from our faculty approach me and say they're having challenges with one of our medical students who is confined to a wheelchair. The words confined to a wheelchair are offensive to someone that uses a wheelchair um, as part of their daily world. The, the, the last reason uh, is, is important to also pay attention. The AAMC has said, this isn't something that is a feel good issue. This is a gap that we have legally. 
that medical schools are legally open to being uh, sued for uh, violations of the ADA because we are so far behind integrating people inside, um, the, inside uh, our learning environments that have disabilities. I will also tell you that there is a group in Colorado, the Colorado Cross Disabilities Coalition, that helps make certain that transportation is accessible and, and makes certain that Medicaid is accessible, that's paying attention to this because they've also understood that this is something that we are, we're lagging behind, that the University of Colorado is working on, but we have some ways to go yet. So we said we'd talk about the social model of disability and how dis people with disabilities are underrepresented. We talked a little bit about why people with uh, trainees are having challenges inside our environment getting in and being successful. Now it's time for the solutions. Linda mentioned that I was president of the AAFP, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and I love advocacy. I think our voices are so important as healthcare providers, as physicians in the larger sphere. And the, the, the model that we use is I encourage people to tell their own story, tell the story about why this is important, to define the issue, and then to make an ask. So we've told you a little bit about our own personal stories. We've talked about the background literature. It's time to make the ask. And our ask for the people on this call are the things that would help make the University of Colorado more accessible for people with disabilities and make residency programs in our teaching environments. Number one, I'd like to ask everyone here on this call to be able to look at their diversity statement. It might be the medical school, it might be nursing or pharmacy, it might be people that have a residency program. If you have a public facing site, look to see if you've got disability as part of your diversity statement. Number two, Look at your technical standards. We'll look at each of them as we go through here in a moment and we'll show you some models because if your technical standards are making it so that people don't think they can get in because we haven't talked about accommodation or we're using outdated technical standards, we're not gonna see them as applicants. And number three, there are ways to build in some support that will help make it easier for people to be successful that have disabilities. And we'll talk about each of those. Remember that uh, our Justice League, as in the Department of Family Medicine, is looking at the diversity um, programs inside our own program? That's an easy change. They added right there the words disability. Now when someone searches to say, what's it like in our program, that is looking like an open and affirming place for someone that could come to our program. For technical standards, it seems pretty daunting to step back and say, what's the right kind of technical standard for us to use? We don't have to make this up. Um, this is the University of Michigan's faculty that has actually recreated their technical standards on a, uh, not on a, on a functional basis about what technical skills need to be done, not based on physical skills. They're willing to do that. You'll also see Lisa Meeks in my upper left corner. Lisa has been consulting with the University of Colorado about helping us update our standards at this time. Now, how do, you, how do you provide support for people? Because people with disabilities, it's not just a type of disability, it's a broad diversity. If there was only, there's only a guide that we could find to help people with, wait, there is a guide. Lisa Meeks that we just said right here has published a guide to assisting students with disabilities. And this is mostly in the undergraduate environment. And she goes through each specific type of disabilities and says, for people with auditory disabilities or people with difficulty with vision or people with difficulty with uh, movement or people that have uh, are regular users of a wheelchair and walk through those. That's a, a book that's available on amazon.com. Uh, one of the things I, I do want to point out um, uh, that, that Alicia was kind enough to say is that when we look at technical standards for the University of Colorado, that uh, Alicia has given me permission. Alicia would not be able to meet admission criteria to the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And yet Alicia is a graduate that has done quite well from our residency program and is currently a fellow here. So our, uh, our, our goal was to talk about the social model of disability to help us think a little bit different about disability, to help us understand that we are really falling short of the ADA goals and our, our own personal goals about diversity of, for people in medicine with disabilities. We wanna talk about some of those challenges so you could hear and see it live. And we wanna talk about three solutions that this group here could do to be able to help make the University of Colorado a more accessible place for people with disabilities. Um, uh, we have included in our slide set many uh, studies that you might want to refer to. And here's the list of the resources. In addition, 
Um, there are some specific um, uh, articles and books and webinars about ways to support people with disabilities and some background um, articles that talk about disability and healthcare equity, disability as a social justice issue. So uh, I wanted to thank you um, for joining us today. And we also wanted to offer our services and input um, on helping you individually with your programs and with the School of Medicine, um, helping us move forward to making us uh, open and affirming uh, university for people with disabilities. So at this point, we'll stop and uh, ask uh, Linda if there are some questions from the group. Thank you so much, Jeff and Alicia. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so in the chat, you'll see if people go into their chat, they'll see that Aaron's been loading some of the uh, resources that um, Jeff and Alicia were mentioning. So uh, please check those out. Um, there were no specific questions. Um, I, I have a question. Wonderful. I, I was going to yeah. just open it up. <laughs> wonderful, Maureen. Great. Hi, I'm Maureen Savio. And um, so I'll add in a personal comment. My mom is a polio survivor and um, parents on one side of her body. And when she was, as I was being raised by her, um, she never wanted accommodation because she didn't want to be different. So how do we balance um, um, accommodation with the message of empowerment? Her mom raised her just like every other kid in the family. She wanted, um, and, and so her perspective is, is, is unique and that's the perspective I grew up with. Um, so I'm really interested in this issue and I'm really grateful for the time that you spent presenting this to us. And I think it's really important for us to consider. So what, what's she, oh, what I was mean, meaning to say is that she felt it was very empowering for her to not receive accommodations to not be treated differently. How do, you, how do we balance those two perspectives? That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, you'll notice that um, the ADA really uh, requires us to have a conversation when someone requests an accommodation. You don't have to ask for an accommodation if you have a disability, if you're able to do the job in the regular sense. Um, mm -hmm. I will tell you that um, there are times when, um, that, that as a person with a disability, that things weren't worked were very well. There are also times that were not uh, thought of. My first faculty meeting that I came to after my, uh, my uh, accident, I had to crawl up a flight of stairs to be able to get into the faculty meeting. Um, moving those faculty meetings. When I had um, a leg that wasn't working very well and I couldn't walk, it was mm -hmm. uh, another faculty member at the University of Colorado step counted that in her, um, for half a day of clinic, she was walking 3,500 steps in that day. That was something I couldn't do. And so there's a difference between what you can do and what is, um, what is something that is the right amount of work for you to be able to do to live your life fully and to do good patient care. So, so are you saying that we should, it should always be on um, the person's initiative to ask for accommodation, you know, because like, or it's, we sh as faculty should ask a student with a disability if they would like accommodations. Alicia? I think it's most important to have the infrastructure there that makes it very obvious that you can safely ask for an accommodation. Um, and if obviously if they self-disclose, it's certainly um, reasonable to ask them if they need help or just say generally, you know, if you need anything, let me know. Um, especially because it's hard to foresee needing an accommodation um, for example, there are things that I needed in residency that I didn't really think about uh, and wasn't really aware of until I got to the rotation um, after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, the anticipation is really hard. I think what's most important is having a safe environment, um, welcoming um, yeah. and set up infrastructure. And kind of the way I think about it is like, if, so our clinics, you know, we track race, for example. So say somebody identifies as Hispanic, but then the, the accommodation is a Spanish interpreter. So not everybody who marks that on their race and ethnicity requires an interpreter, but if they, they need it, we have it. So it's, it's something similar um, where we just need to have the infrastructure and have it be known that that's available. I, from a faculty perspective, I will say that the Department of Foundation did an excellent job with me. That it was hard to, at times to ask for an accommodation. When I interviewed for my job, um, I was asked um, if I could do the job with accommodation. 
people knew that I had had a challenge before. And that was the extent of it. I think that having the conversation or interview uh, centered around that need for combination is no more necessary than it is having a conversation around childbearing plans during the time for a woman that uh, during a residency program because that's part of what we need to do as a legal rule in our society. We have to be able to work with uh, life choices and uh, life paths for men and women and people with disabilities, that's a legal requirement. The flip side is, is that, um, that, that unless I asked for the accommodation, the university does not have a legal right or a legal need or requirement to be able to step up to do that. I have to be able to ask for that and that's the way the, the legal interpretation of the ADA is. So when I used a wheelchair, I asked for being able to have my workspace be close to the edge and close to the room. Um, and that's different than when I was able to, to walk well earlier in my career. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I'm gonna pop in here and just comment a little. Um, so I, I was Alicia's program director, luckily. Um, and uh, I just wanted to be a little reassuring to program directors. Um, you know, when I, I know that we all, it's a little, when we're um, hiring a resident, it's a little bit different than hiring a quote unquote regular employee, right? We have certain things that we are told we have to meet, certain um, numbers of things and procedures that have to be met, right? Um, and so I did do a little homework um, when Alicia, um, applied and contacted our American Board of Family Medicine and our um, RRC for Family Medicine and just um, made sure that I wasn't going to accept someone I could never then have become board certified because of any kind of limitations. They were incredibly helpful. Um, it wasn't like there was an expert there, but I was able to get documentation that I would be able to graduate Alicia successfully um, with what I thought would be any kind of accommodation. And um, so it wasn't, it was, it, it made it much more um, quieting for me to be able to, to accept Alicia knowing that I could successfully make her a family doctor. Um, I, well, are a little, some questions that have popped up here. First of all, Tracy, um, I believe that the slides um, will, as long as Jeff and Alicia say it's okay, they will be loaded onto the, uh, um, Academy of Medical Educators has a very nice um, page now um, with all of our presentations and some recordings as well. Um, and so those will be shared there, I believe. Um, there is a question um, here that, um, do you have thoughts about how to educate those of us who have already been in practice for a long time regarding how we can be better prepared for working with our learners with disabilities? We need this ongoing education as mentors, teachers of a wide variety of learners. So any um, take homes for people there, Jeff or Alicia? I think that's a, this is new, I think. When you look around, um, this is, I think if you step back, this is about the same level of having a conversation about 10 years ago uh, or 15 years ago about people that have a different ethnicity or sexual orientation, or maybe 30 years ago for people that were women in healthcare. And I, I do not know of a lot of existing resources other than the things that we've presented with you today. The things that documented the, there was a, the, Double AMC and UCSF is an excellent uh, uh, about 40 page article with about a three page uh, um, uh, first page introduction that looked that's quite good to be able to go to overviews. Um, I don't know of any other good resources either other than the things that we we placed. I think mostly just having the conversation is going to be the important part and having it on everybody's radar uh, just so that keeps moving the conversation forward um, and make baby steps towards that change. We at the University of Colorado at our Department of Family Medicine are helping um, interviewers understand about how we can be respectful of people that are different than us in the interview process. Um, including this as part of that training would be helpful. Um, in terms of helping take care of people with disabilities, the CCDC that we mentioned, the Colorado Cross Disabilities Coalition is now developing um, a training module that's video online to be able to help practicing doctors understand how to better talk with and understand the issues of people that are disabilities, that are patients that are coming into their office. Um, so I think those are different ways to be able to look at the community. I think that that including intentionally inside the curriculum 
There are some groups like the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine have specific modules about how to talk with trainees about uh, teaching people with disabilities and they have a work group around integrating people with disabilities inside medical education. So I know inside our own specialty that those resources are available. Next question is for you, Alicia. Have you been, have you ever considered filing any kind of complaint with those programs that wouldn't accommodate? Um, at the time I definitely did, but I think I didn't have the energy to, and now I guess I have not, I think it's, I've not actually filed a complaint, but it's um, something that I think does need to be addressed. I think I did talk to faculty members um, at that program that I did know about, um, about that happening um, and they were aware. So I think internally they probably had some discussions, um, but I think at the time I was a little overwhelmed with it yeah. happening a week before rank night. So mm -hmm. just, just really paid attention to making my rank list. Um, and then finish med school. So I did not. Got moved to a new city. And, yeah. yeah, got it. And, and I did residency and yeah. Um, but, I, but I think it is uh, indicative of kind of a change in discussion that needs to, to happen. I know one of the things that's a, a slightly different shade than that is that when people are, we know that there are very few people coming through medical school with disabilities, but we also know that people inside the practice of medicine acquire disabilities at the same rate as the general population does. That's a different talk, but um, that, that process of having to uh, renegotiate who you are clinically and professionally when you acquire a disability can be challenging also for a program. It's challenging for the person that's going through it, but it's also oftentimes challenging for the, the program. When someone has a disability and comes to a program and says, here are the things that are helpful, that's an easier negotiation like I had with the University of Colorado that it is for somebody that has acquired something. And that's very oftentimes hard for the program. It's important to separate their health care from their legal care from their, um, the, the person that's their boss at their program. Mm -hmm. The next question is from Brian Bocek, who's asking you, Jeff, about your national role at the AFP. Kind of, you have sort of a broad understanding. Um, can you, have you run across any uh, bright spots in institutions that are exemplars in this field, um, who's doing well? Who can we who can we steal from? Um, I think the AAMC is way on top of this. They understand they are ready for resources to be able to help us. Um, I I find that that at the higher level that the organizations have been very helpful. As a national leader, um, I had challenges with how far I could walk, and I. I was a very, the American Academy of Family Physicians said, we'll do what it takes for you to be successful because I was there representing them. Um, and so um, I, I think the AMC is an excellent resource for us at the University of Colorado and for our residency programs. Great, thanks. Kim, Kim raised her hand in the chat. Would you like to share, Kim? Sure, thank you. My name is Dr. Kimberly Jackson. I previously practiced in family medicine, but because of my disabilities, I had a number of severe disabilities that cropped up. Um, I'm no longer able to practice. And I actually know Jeff, I've done work with him through the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. And I've also connected with Alicia through the disability community. And I just have a few comments to make. I mean, the other side of not being represented in training is that people with disabilities um, don't have the same outcomes. There was a study that came out a number of years ago in the Journal of Public Health that showed there are a lot of health disparities in the disability population that really has nothing to do with our disability. So for example, someone with a spinal cord injury who also has diabetes and their blood sugar is not as well controlled because they have trouble accessing medicine. And so um, it really, there are a lot of trickle down effects to not being represented in med medical education. There was a study that was done of emergency room providers that showed that 18% of emergency room providers surveyed w thought that they would be glad to survive a spinal cord injury, where if you talk to spinal cord injury patients, 92% said that they are glad that they survived. And so, I mean, there are a lot of these disparities that get set up by not being represented in training. Um, and then my other two comments are just, um, I mean, we talked about race, gender, gen or gender identity, sexual orientation, um, religion as um, minority populations, but there's also a lot of intersectionality where there are people who identify as queer and transgender and also have a disability or also people of color. 
And so that also then, I mean, we get a lot of these disparities bumping up against each other. Um, and my last comment is I have autism. I was born with it, of course. Um, I mean, I am very functional in my life in many ways, but there are a lot of people like me who go through medical education with invisible disabilities. And that can make it very hard too to ask for accommodations because people might not believe you because it's not obvious that, okay, you're in a wheelchair and, um, or okay, you're deaf and you need sign language interpretation. And so that can be another area too in medical education that is underserved, maybe not as much as we realize because it's not talked about, but that's an area where people can have a lot of trouble getting accommodations as well. So Jeff, Alicia, thank you so much for this talk. It's been wonderful. And I don't know if you have any comments on all of that. I could talk for hours about this stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. I, one of the things uh, I have done some um, uh, reading about uh, the way that people inside medicine experience uh, disability, it uh, turns out that that one of the defense mechanisms that we have is that the people in medicine oftentimes have a higher level of fear of death and disability than the general population does. And that we tend to shelter at that some ways. Some of that is there's a, a Superman or attempt to be able to overcompensate that I've been guilty of in my time. And I've learned that that hasn't helped me when that gets in the way of taking good care of patients or myself, I've had to reassign and reassess how I was doing in the world that way. So thank you, Kim. The next question is again from Tracy. And it, so saying that she's worked with a student who uses a wheelchair and needs accommodation with equipment, how can we make those changes so that equipment is universally utilized? Any, Alicia, any, I know that you might have a, any, some thoughts about that. Yeah, I think um, just to understand the question better. So, so how to make the equipment accessible for that student, I think really depends on what that student needs. So even two students who uh, use wheelchairs, they may need different accommodations. So I'm thinking of, um, there was somebody at my med school who needed a, a chair that would stand, but then I'm, I also know another person who uh, would get autonomic dysreflexia if they were standing. So it's not necessarily the same accommodation that would be needed for both of those students. So I think it's more about asking that student what they need, where and when, in the best way that they can anticipate. Um, I think looking at clerk tricks, for example, for me, what I did is that I contacted all the clerk directors probably at the end of my second year, um, actually probably even earlier, before step studying really ramped up, um, and then kind of got in contact with them said, you know, I have this disability. This is what I've done for my clinical accommodations for my exam. Um, this is what I first see. Mostly it was around OBGYN and surgery that I, I needed to be more thoughtful about it. So that, for example, I learned how to scrub in um, before third year um, with one of the scrub nurses um, and just ran through and made sure that I, I could keep a sterile field um, and we had a, and that there was a stool in there. And so everybody just knew that they had to Hold the gloves out for me and then I wasn't going to self-glove essentially um, before I got there. Um, but I did a lot of legwork at the beginning um, by identif self-identifying and disclosing to the clerkship directors and then they put me in touch with those folks at the sites that I would be at. And then the, my school did decide to um, keep all of my clerkships at um, our local hospital rather than having me go to the VA and then some other private hospitals as well. Um, so I think that's probably the best solution and there's no way to anticipate something that will work universally. It's more just asking each student what they need. Um, and then on the back end, when you're going through the rotations, being sure that there's somebody identified who can address anything that comes up um, um, unexpectedly. So I wanted to highlight two things she said twice there. One of them is that that there's not a way to have one set of accommodations that works with all disabilities, even with someone that uses a wheelchair. And secondly, that she had to do a lot of pre-work herself. One of the things that would be very helpful for the Office of Accommodation is to have an ombudsman that can help with that process, that we know that a learner has, a, has need of some specific accommodations and help them pre-navigate ahead of time would be very helpful. And to have that person also be available when there are challenges so that there can be a go-between and so that the learner doesn't have to go to their supervisor to be able to solve those issues that are that are necessary at a higher level that sometimes the supervisor uh, 
teaching uh, resident or attending may not understand. All right, thank you. Um, we have um, Dr. S uh, William Skesla, I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> pronouncing that poorly, um, who'd like to make a comment. And while he's doing that, because I know some of you will be rushing off to clinic, um, we, uh, Dr. Zimmer's put up our grand rounds. Um, if you scan that, um, you will uh, be able to get to our questionnaire um, about today and um, also information about the other grand rounds. Dr. Bill? Yeah. yeah, so uh, um, jumping in a little late to the conversation, but um, I've had paraplegia now for almost 30 years, was able to go through medical school and residency training and, you know, now employed as a physician. I work here at Craig Hospital. Um, but going through the process, I agree with a lot of the things that people have said, but one comment I would make is that um, it's almost impossible to, to educate everybody on every specific disability. There is a lot inherent to an individual trying to uh, advocate for as much as they can for themselves and uh, providing an open environment has been talked about. But I would also uh, emphasize trying not to uh, have people who, who don't necessarily know how to handle the disability to, to make the decisions. There are many, there are many resources you have uh, within the hospital. For example, uh, the wheel, uh, example of a uh, uh, medical student using a wheelchair. You have the physical medicine and rehabilitation departments. You have uh, access to us at Craig Hospital here, which are you know in town, where we have a great deal of expertise in trying to problem solve these things. And I think working with an individual and uh, other people who know how to help the problem is paramount to, to making things successful. Excellent comments, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I think we are right about at one o'clock. Um, I wanna thank Drs. Kane and Dr. Wong so thank you so much for being here today. We've learned so much. We really appreciate your time and your energy. Thank you for everyone who's loaded things into the chat. And we'll put some things up on the uh, Grand Rounds um, page as well. Yeah, I just to add my thanks to everybody for participating today. Um, Dr. Kane, Dr. Wong, thank you for being here and for sharing um, your presentation with us and we will have both the recording and the slides up on the website. I think you've also given me a lot of food for thought from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion perspective about um, ways to incorporate um, upstander training and this discussion uh, moving forward. And as you know, we're looking at our technical standards at the school and have been engaged with um, Dr. Meeks um, for her advice about how to make this a better and more inclusive place for everybody um, at CU. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna emphasize um, the comments that you made just so that everybody realizes them. And that is that diversity of all types improves the outcomes for our patients. Um, and just kind of uh, tagging on to Dr. Jackson's earlier comments about the fact that um, having people with different abilities um, around the table actually improves the um, decisions that we make for our patients, which is the entire purpose of the whole campus here. So um, thank you for that reminder. Everybody have a great day and don't forget to vote. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you.